All right, Ephesians 5, 21 to, to 6, verse 9, Paul's discussing the relationships in the ancient household. And in chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, he addresses slaves and masters. Saw last week that Christian slaves, they're told that they're to serve their earthly masters wholeheartedly because that service is part of their discipleship. That's part of what they, they give to the Lord. And Christian masters are likewise to make their service of the one heavenly master determinative of their actions. He's, he's their master, the, the slave's master, and theirs. They're to make that relationship determine their actions. They're to not to be you know, uh, mean, harsh, and that kind of thing. And so what we were looking at at the end of the class last week, I made the point that, that the fact God tolerated a regulated form of first century slavery doesn't mean he would tolerate that same form of slavery in a different social context. I tried to pa paint for you, you know, the circumstances where you could say, well, maybe he's tolerating it because of the hardness of people's hearts at that time and the way the world was at that time. So it doesn't mean that he would tolerate that same form of slavery in a different social context, or does it mean that he would tolerate a different form of slavery, such as the slavery in the, we in, in the Western world, American slavery? And I wanted to explain to you some of the differences. You may know this, but I wanted to read to you a fairly lengthy reading, so I'm going to ask that you hang with me. It was too long to put up here on the slides. And I want to read to you, it's over four or five pages of S. Scott Barchi's article on slavery in the Anchor Bible Dictionary. He's an expert on this subject. He's written there on it. He's also written in the Dictionary of uh, New Testament background on the subject. So uh, the, the paragraphs I'm reading to you, they're not continuous. I have omitted some things just for space. But try to stick with me when I read these to you, because I think some of it uh, you may know, but uh, I just want you to understand how first century slavery differed from what we typically think of slavery, the experience of American slavery. All right, Barchi, he, he writes, he says, central features that distinguish first century slavery from that later practiced in the New World are the following. Racial factors played no role. Okay, had absolutely nothing to do with it. Education was greatly encouraged and enhanced a slave's value. Some slaves were better educated than their owners. Many slaves carried out sensitive and highly responsible social functions. Slaves could own property, including other slaves. Their religious and cultural traditions were the same as those of the freeborn. No laws prohibited public assembly of slaves, and perhaps above all, the majority of urban and domestic slaves could legitimately anticipate being emancipated by the age of 30. It must also be stressed that despite the neat legal separation between owners and slaves, in none of the relevant cultures did persons in sla slavery constitute a social or economic class. Slaves' individual honor, social status, and economic opportunities were entirely dependent on the status of their respective owners, and they developed no recognizable consciousness of being a group or of suffering a common plight. So it wasn't like we had, I'm a slave, you're a slave. They identified with the status of the, of the owner, okay, which is a, is a completely different thing. He says, for this reason, any such call as slaves of the world unite would have fallen on completely deaf ears. Furthermore, by no means were those in slavery regularly to be found at the bottom of the social economic pyramid. Rather, in that place were those free and impoverished persons who had to look for work each day without any certainty of finding it. Day laborers. You see, they were the ones at the bottom of the social economic ladder, some of whom eventually sold themselves, these day laborers, some of whom eventually sold themselves into slavery to gain some job security. Large numbers of people sold themselves into slavery for various reasons. For example, to pay debts, to climb socially. Roman citizenship was conventionally bestowed on a slave released by a Roman owner to obtain special jobs and above all to enter a life that was more secure and less strenuous than existence as a poor, freeborn person. Slaves were used for an enormous variety of functions in enormously different circumstances, some of which when compared to New World slavery seem astonishingly responsible. Doctors, teachers, writers, accountants, agents, bailiffs, overseers, secretaries, and sea captains. Okay, that's not how, that's not our picture of slavery. And it wasn't 
American slavery. Okay, so you have to understand something of the difference here. Slaves were used, for, okay, since slaves represented a substantial investment by their owners, they could at least expect to receive enough food to keep them alive and working. Manumission, their release, uh, could, mean, uh, could mean the end of that security. Epictetus, he was a first century philosopher, himself an ex-slave, he took pleasure in pointing out that the slave who thinks only of gaining his freedom may be reduced when he's manumitted to slavery much more severe than before. Okay, if you get booted out, you lose all uh, of the security that you had, and you're out there as a, as a, a freeborn day laborer, and you might find yourself thinking, hey, uh, this was a bad deal. For many, self-sale into slavery with the anticipation of manumission was regarded as the most direct means to be integrated into Greek and Roman society. For many, this was the quickest way to climb socially and financially. As such, in stark contrast to New World slavery, the Greco-Roman slavery functioned as a process rather than a permanent condition, as a temporary phase of life by means of which an outsider obtained a place within a society that has no natural obligations of kinship or guest friendship towards him. Okay, let me quote to you another fellow. Andrew Lincoln, this is in his commentary, he says, Many slaves in the Greco-Roman world enjoyed more favorable living conditions than many free laborers. So I wanted to give you S. Scott Barchi. I'm giving you Andrew Lincoln. So you can kind of see that these guys are on the same page to give you some confidence in what I'm telling you. Contrary to the supposition that everyone was trying to avoid slavery at all costs, it is clear that some people actually sold themselves into slavery in order to climb socially to obtain particular employment open only to slaves and to enjoy a better standard of living than they had experienced as free persons. Being a slave had the benefit of providing a certain personal and social security. Okay, so you have this, uh, this sense. I just want you to see when we think about this, when you're trying to figure out why is God tolerating a regulated form of first century slavery? There are a couple of things I think it may be due to a, a concession to the hardness of people's hearts. It may be that the situation was such that the thorn of slavery had to be removed slowly. But in, in considering that, I wanted you to understand something of the difference between first century slavery and the slavery that we think of. It was a completely different social institution. Now, we had people in early America using that fact to justify slavery, American slavery. And if you go back historically, you'll see a lot of people quoting the Bible, okay? That's why the Bible has to be used carefully, okay? <laughs> you have so, so you, you tell you, slavery, you see? And they use that to justify something that I'm sure distressed God, in a sense, okay? All right, uh, let's go on. 610, now until it was 40 weeks and we're finally here, brother. We're here. 610 to 20 says, finally, be strengthened in the Lord, that is in the power of his strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world-controlling powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done all things, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having wrapped your waist with the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having fitted the feet with the readiness of the gospel of peace. In addition to all these, having taken up the shield of faith by which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, with every kind of prayer and petition, praying at all times in the spirit, and to this end, keeping alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and for me, that a word may be given me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains so that I may speak boldly about it as is necessary for me to speak. Okay, Paul here, he turns his attention. The righteous living that he's been urging on them, particularly since chapter 4, verse 1. You have some of the exhortation in the earlier part. But mainly you get this exhortation to live righteously beginning in chapter 4, verse 1. Well, that exhortation, that righteous living that he's been calling them to, to exercise or to show is not without opposition. Okay? God's will in your life is not without opposition. And Paul urges them to be strengthened in the power of the Lord's strength. Because there is a war going on. Here's what O'Brien says. He says, Christ's triumph over the powers 
has already occurred. I spent a lot of time with this already and not yet. You're going to hear more about that when we introduce the parables because it's an important concept, okay? He says, Christ's triumph over the powers has already occurred, chapter 1, verse 21, so believers no longer live in fear of them, but the fruits of that victory have not yet been fully realized, so Christians must be aware of the conflict and be equipped with divine power to stand against them. Okay, there is a war going on. All right, taking the, this first imperative here, be strengthened. A lot of times it's translated be strong, but if you take it as a passive, he says, listen, be strengthened. He's commanding them to lay hold of the strength that Christ provides. You take hold of it. You be strengthened. Lay hold of that strength. He will make them strong for battle, but we have a role to play in the process. Right? He's telling them to do something. Christ will empower you. He will make you strong, but you have a role. You don't just fall back. Do it. You see, any more than eating, you don't just throw the stuff in here and say, feed me. Uh. You have a role to play. And so he's telling them, he says, listen, you be strengthened. Christ will, he will strengthen you. He'll make you strong, but you have a role to play. You must appropriate the power the Lord provides. We have a role to play, and he's going he's to identify that. They must appropriate the Lord's power. Why? Because they're not fighting mere men. Do you think you're going to go into a battle against these beings? And you sit and say, hell, you know, what? Are, they're just a joke. No, there's a war. There's a war, and you have these evil spiritual beings led by Satan. He's the chief, and we're in a battle. And he says, you want to be in that battle, you better be strengthened by the Lord. Or you're going to get mopped up. Okay, he's telling them, be strengthened. We're in this battle. See, we are engaged in this deadly war against evil spirit beings that are under the devil's leadership. Let me say a little bit about Satan. The Hebrew name Satan, it, des it derives from a verb meaning to be or to act as an adversary. Okay, and then the Greek word Satan is just a transliteration of the Hebrew name Satan. And the most common Greek reference or, or description of Satan is the devil, diabolos. That's the, that's the most common Greek reference to him, which may have come from a verb meaning to separate. Okay, now if that's correct, if, it, if diabolos comes from a verb meaning to separate, it implies the idea of one who separates humans from God, which is perfectly fitting. Okay, now this, this being, there are a lot of other terms used to describe him. They include, I'm not going to give you all the references, you can look on the website, but all the texts where these come from. Accuser, tempter, Beelzebul, evil one, Belial, enemy or adversary, deceiver, great dragon, father of lies, murderer and destroyer. And we think he's kind of cute. We think it's kind of comical to talk about in our society, you know, the devil, ha, yeah, yeah, yeah. We just have no idea of this power, this being, and how vicious he is, and what he's after. And he is at work in doing it. Now, Satan, and implicitly his minions, he employs a multitude of deceptive schemes and stratagems to lure and trick his enemies. Okay, this is his modus operandi. He uses these schemes and stratagems as he sits here and he tells him, he says, be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now he uses these schemes and stratagems to lure us away, to turn us from God and his purposes. He's clever. He's been around a long time. He's observed human beings a long time. He plays you like a Stradivarius. Here's what Klein Snodgrass says. He says, mention of the schemes of the devil reminds us of the trickery and subterfuge by which evil and temptation present themselves in our lives. Evil rarely looks evil until it accomplishes its goal. It gains entrance by appearing attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. It is a baited and camouflaged trap. You see, and if you're not paying attention, you have to be aware of this. You see it happening to other people more readily than you see it happening to yourself. But sometimes you just see somebody going, no, what are you doing? You don't see what's happening. You don't see you're being pulled. 
You're being lured. You're being turned away. No, 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 yeah, no. You see, and this is how he operates. This is what he winds up doing. He operates that way, and Paul has already, he's referred to Satan in chapter 2, verse 2. He's referred to him there as the ruler of the domain of the air. Okay, the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Okay? The ruler of the domain of the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. He's there. He's active. I don't believe in that. I can't see him. Hey, let me tell you, there's a lot of stuff you can't see. You know? A lot of stuff you can't see. That's the whole thing of a spiritual battle. You see, but he's referred to Satan in 2.2, and he's also, he's warned them in chapter 4, verse 27, not to give the devil an opening that he can exploit, right? Don't give him a foothold. Why is that? Because he'll run right through there with a spear. You have to be on guard. You have to be concerned and aware of this threat. It's clear that Satan and his minions, they're able to manifest in this physical reality in the human stream, in the human experience, their opposition to God's purposes. They are able to get their opposition to God's purposes to introduce that opposition into the human stream. But we're not told the mechanics of how they do it. But they can do it. All right, but we're, well, how do they do it? What is the interface between what they're trying to do, how do they operate so that they introduce their opposite? We're not told. What's the physics of it? We're not told. But it's clear that they can do it. You can see in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul attributes there, he attributes to demons the false teachings of certain people. Well, do you think the people who are doing this, do you think they're sitting there going, blah, 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 blah. You think that's how they're acting or do you think they're just saying things that are false? And Paul knows that the origin of what they're saying is demonic. That's how it works. Well, how did they do that? How did they get the ideas and the concepts that these false teachers are presenting? How did the demons get that into this realm? He doesn't tell you. He doesn't tell you. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he says that Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. He's made it so belief in God seems counterintuitive. And our culture is perfectly wrapped up in this. Our culture, that just seems stupid. The whole idea of a spiritual reality, that just seems, that's crazy. This is the 21st century. You're back in the superstition times. You need to get with it. You believe in a spiritual reality? I had a guy almost fall out of his chair asking me if I believed in witches. I said, hey, baby, there's a, there's a whole realm out here. He just thought, you know, just thought I was crazy. And that's how our world is. Now, who has given them that idea? How has our world been taken so that the things the Bible describes as reality, people just look at it and say, that's stupid. I haven't tasted one, touched one, felt one. I don't believe it. If I can't see it, I don't believe it. That reminds me of when Brother John was uh, dogging me with the gospel many years ago. Our joke was is that I thought that if you couldn't eat it, it wasn't real. You see, it was like, no, nah, man. If it's not something I can touch and detect with the instruments of science, well, then it's stupid. It's not real. And he led me out of that with a lot of things like, why do you think that? Huh? Why do you think it's not real? A lot of stuff real that you can't see, feel, taste. But anyway, you see this idea and what's happened. Now, as an aside, let me say a bit about the demon possession. It seems to be a topic people uh, light up about. But demons can possess people. I don't know how anybody, you know, you look in the New Testament. Look in the Bible. There, demons are taking possession of people. We see it in many places in Scripture, but there are a number of questions about it. Right? I mean, we have questions about this. Compared to the rest of the Bible and to the modern Western society, it seems that demons, they took possession of people with astonishing frequency during Christ's ministry. You just look at what's happening uh, in Christ's ministry, compare it to the rest of the Bible, compare it to modern Western society, and it seems like the demons were going crazy taking, taking possession of people. They're all over the place. Well, Dwayne Garrett, in his book, uh, The a Angels and the New Spirituality, he gives some what I thought were thoughtful possibilities on what's going on here. Garrett says, first, 
Demon activity may have been more common when Jesus was on earth because of the spiritual conflict surrounding the incarnation. Maybe Christ's presence here just roiled things. Maybe it just created this great spiritual upheaval, so they were very active, and they thought their strategy was, we'll be grabbing people more and more. Okay, maybe it had something to do with the incarnation. He says, second, perhaps demon possession is still common, but we don't recognize it as easily as Jesus did. We've got some psychological answer for it. Oh, demons, you're stupid. Demons don't really exist. Ah, I've grown beyond that. No, no, no. This is a multiple personality. This is something else. Okay? Maybe there's something to that. Maybe we are so naturalistic that we wouldn't know demon possession if it slapped us in the face. And maybe they're happy to keep it that way. He says, third, Jesus happened to come during a time that was politically, socially, and religiously unstable when people embraced strange new types of spirituality. Thus, demon possession was more common. On the third view, demonic activity waxes and wanes in different times and different places in proportion to the behavior of the society. Personally, I think there's truth in all three explanations, he says, and I think that's right. Do you see this third one, this idea that maybe society and its attitudes and thoughts and views affects how this works. So demon possession waxes and wanes. Maybe in a culture like ours, the smart move on the demon's part is, don't show yourself because these people are so lost in naturalism, you'll help them out of it by doing that. Just help keep them thinking that there is no spiritual world. Now you go to Africa, and anybody who knows anything about the circumstances there, you get a lot of people who are telling you about things that happened there. Now, why is that? How can that be? It has to be the same in America as it is in Africa, or it's not. No, maybe the demons see that, hey, in this society and culture, a better approach is the possession. Now, who can say that's impossible? Okay, I look at it and I say, I can see demons saying to Americans, you just stay on this road of naturalism. We came from nowhere out of nothing by chance. There is no spiritual reality. It's all just physics, matter and law over time shaking itself out. And you happen to appear, you're going to grow up, you're going to die, and that's the end of it. And the universe will end in a big collapse. And there's no meaning, no purpose, no value, no God, no right, no wrong. Just keep telling them that. All right, well, maybe that would, that would make sense to me. That would sell in our society. So all three of these things, I think there's something, there's something there. But whatever the overall level of demon activity, I'm convinced that a Christian who's faith, faithfully abiding in Christ cannot be demon-possessed in the sense of being indwelt by a demon. Okay, I don't think that can happen to a Christian. Now, the reasons I don't think that can happen to a Christian is that Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, that the Christian is controlled by what? The indwelling Spirit of God. Okay, he is controlled by the indwelling Spirit of God. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, and there simply is no agreement between the temple of God and idols. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. So, okay, we are controlled by, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's how Christians are. So I don't see any basis for a demon coming in and possessing a Christian. Okay, I don't see how that would work. Secondly, I see, in, uh, I see in the New Testament, Christians are told to resist Satan standing firm in the faith, and he will flee from you. I love that. Standing firm in the faith, and he will flee from you. You see that in 1 Peter 5, 9, James chapter 4, verse 7. And since fleeing is the opposite of possessing, it seems to me that faithful Christians are immune to demon possession. Okay, so I don't worry about demon possession. I don't want to be crazy. You know, I, I don't want to ignore it and say, well, it doesn't happen. That demons aren't here. They are here. Okay, they are here and they have this capability, but I don't think they touch a Christian. And then the fact there are no examples in Scripture of a faithful Christian being indwelt by a demon, it reinforces in my mind that conclusion. Okay, so I don't think about that. Don't worry about it. Now, that's not to say that Christians are immune to demonic influences. Okay? That's a different issue. I'm talking about possession. You see, the, the question is one of nature and degree of demonic influence. Possession is something where you are, you are totally taken over. But, you know, we're, we, we're subject to influences. 
plottings, lurings. You see, we're, we're subject to influences. It's a question of the nature and extent of those influences. Whatever the nature and extent of those influences are that we call possession, I don't think that Christians can be possessed. But we have to be on our toes against demonic influences because that's just what he's telling them here, right? About the schemes of the devil. Well, if you're totally immune to the influences, why worry about the schemes of the devil? You've got to be on your toes about the schemes of the devil. Okay, so there's a difference between influences and possession. Now, of course, it goes without saying that we should absolutely avoid occultic practices. I assume you know this. You know, all of this kind of stuff where you're trying to contact the dead and all of this stuff trying to open yourself up to demonic forces and influences. Why would you ever do that? Why would you do that? All right, he says, uh, now the way that they're to appropriate the Lord's power... He tells them, be strengthened in the Lord. You have a role to play in appropriating the Lord's power in this battle. And we're talking about a serious spiritual battle that's going on. And the way that they're to appropriate the Lord's power is by putting on the full armor of God. Okay, meaning the full array of offensive and defensive equipment that God supplies. The whole package. He emphasizes full armor. Put on the whole thing. The threat's so serious that they need to don the whole armor of God to be able to stand their ground so as to prevail in the fight. That applies to us. We need to put on the whole armor so we can stand our ground to prevail in the fight so as to resist in a time of particularly severe assault, which he labels here the evil day. There'll be times when you'll really be uh, pressed, pushed, And he says, you need to put on the full armor of God if you're going to stand when that particular assault comes because we're in a war. I don't care what this world tells me about coming from nowhere out of nothing by chance. We are in a spiritual war and we need to be prepared for it. And he's telling these Ephesians, I have commanded you to live in certain ways. There is opposition to this. You need to be aware of it. And to fight in this battle, you need to put on the full armor of God. And he specifies the divine armor they need to put on if they're to stand firm. Okay, and he obviously is following Roman uh, military equipment. But you've heard this. He says to them that he refers to the belt of truth and that probably refers to the leather, leather apron that hung beneath a Roman soldier's armor and protected his thighs. Okay, so he's got this very tough, thick apron that's hanging around down there. So if somebody's hacking or stabbing at his thighs, he's got that, he's got that covered. And the Christian, he says, well, what does it mean? When he says, listen, you're to appropriate this, you are to put on the belt of truth. Well, we are to be people of truth. Christians are to be people who are committed to the truth. A passion for the truth will protect you from Satan's schemes, which routinely depend on some kind of compromise or distortion of the truth. If you have a real zeal for truth, cut, you want to say, listen, I want to know the truth of the matter. I don't care how it hurts me or anything. I want to know the truth of the circumstance and situation. That will act as a protection. Because his schemes rely on compromise and distortion of the truth. You see that. Well, I deserve to do this. This is unfair. I need this. God wants me to be happy. God doesn't care. This doesn't hurt anybody. And on and on and on. Where we lie to ourselves and deceive ourselves. And are sitting here and rationalizing and justifying a passion for the truth. Give me the truth. Right in the face. Let me have it. A passion for the truth of the situation and the circumstance. The truth of God's diagnosis of the situation will act as a protection against the schemes of the devil. Okay, so he tells them first the belt of truth. He speaks of the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate, it covered the Roman soldier's chest to protect him from from blows when he's in a battle. You know, warfare in that day, this was tough stuff. You know, you're in there, you're in there duking it out. But he's got this breastplate to protect him both from blows and from arrows. And you say, well, all right, how is that? Our appropriating that, how does that protect us? Well, a commitment to righteousness is a protection against Satan. 
He tells us, listen, you're to don this. You're to put this on. You are to be somebody who cares about righteousness. If you become lax with regard to righteousness, with regard to doing what is right, doing what is just, caring about the will of God, no, I'm going to do that. I don't care what happens to me. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to live this way. I'm going to treat my wife right. I'm going to do this and this and this. Because I love the Lord Jesus, I'm committed to that. Okay, a passion for righteousness will be a protection for you because if you let that down and start saying, it's just really not that important how I live, whether I do right, whether I do justice, you do that and your vital organs are exposed and Satan will exploit it. He will exploit it. You let your guard down and start talking to yourself and telling yourself it doesn't really matter how I live. Everybody does it. I know those folks at church. They all do these kinds of things. I'm not going to be out there, you know, Okay, well, you just open that door and he will, because there's a war going on. He says, feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. Readiness for battle comes from an appreciation of the gospel as the gospel of peace, as a source of our peace with God and with one another. And if we undervalue that peace, if we undervalue the reconciliation that we have, we will be more easily influenced to disrupt that reconciliation. We have to appreciate as Christians that the gospel is a gospel of peace. It has given us peace with God. It has given us peace with one another. And appreciate that. Appreciate what that means. If you don't, if you don't, you'll be easily tempted or more easily tempted to uh, disrupt that peace between God and other Christians and other people. Okay, so I think that's what he's after. And he says a shield of faith. He says here, this refers to this large shield that these Roman soldiers carried that covered their entire person. Okay, so they've got this big shield here. And when soaked with water, it would extinguish flaming arrows because you had these guys, they dip their arrows in pitch and shoot them. Okay, so he's got this shield, which they would soak in water. And when it would hit there, it would extinguish the flaming arrows. And he's telling him, listen... This shield that extinguishes flaming arrows of an enemy. He says, look, Satan's flaming arrows. Those things are going to be extinguished by faith in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, how does that happen? How is faith a protection against the attack of the enemy? Well, by faith, one sees beyond the immediate. Right? One sees beyond the immediate and is able to put all the temptations in proper perspective. You and I understand the truth of what God has given us in Jesus Christ. We understand that a day is coming when all the suffering and sorrow and mourning and struggle and death and everything is going to be gone. Okay, we're convinced of that and we live in light of that. Right? We conduct ourselves. Why? Because I've I've used the example from the Terminator. You know, that I like the TV show they canceled. But one of the things I liked about it is is that here you had this small band of people in the present who knew the future. And because of their knowledge of the future, they conducted themselves in a way the world looked at them and said, you're crazy. They say, you may think I'm crazy, but I know what's coming. All right, well, you see how it affects you. All right, that's how it is with faith. It is a protection against the schemes of the devil. It is God who loves us, who's given us an inheritance in Jesus Christ, and who will deliver on his promises. And pleasing and honoring him is more important than any threat or bauble that Satan can dangle. Okay, he's got all kinds of charms he works on you here. This will be nice. This will be fun. This will be luxurious. This will be great. Come, come, come. And the person of faith says, I see you. I see you, and I know the Lord Jesus Christ, and I know what is coming, and I'm going to be faithful to, to him. And on that day, on that day, I'll look and say, you tried to sucker me. You tried to sucker me, but I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has blessed me. He has blessed me. The helmet of salvation. Accepting the fact of one's salvation, it both motivates and strengthens one in the pursuit of godliness. Okay, we have to understand this. This idea of chewing your fingers all the time about, you know, am I doing enough stuff to be saved? You say, well, do you trust the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you love him? Are you committed to Jesus? Yeah, I love him. He died for me. He is my atonement. And then we're chewing our fingers. Well, that will be exploited. 
that uncertainty will be exploited by the enemy to sit there and say, listen, you can't do this stuff. You come, who are you kidding? Look at you. I know what you think. I know the things that run through your head. I know how you treated that person the other day. Do you really think? Do you really think that God is going to take you? You're a joke. Quit. Give up. Why don't you just go living the way you're showing you really want to live anyway? Why don't you be true to yourself? Do you see? Do you see how that would work? You sit here and say, listen, it's a good thing I'm not saved by how I perform. It's a good thing that I'm saved by the perfect one, Jesus Christ. Yell at me all you want. I'm holding on to him. And you're not suckering me with that. You're not getting me to quit. I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to get me to let go. And I'm never going to let go. Never going to let go. Okay, you see this helmet of salvation, I think it's important. Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the only offensive weapon he mentions. Now, the sword referred to that's this relatively short thing, of even a dagger, that's an important weapon in close combat. Okay, now the Word of God probably refers here to a proclamation of the gospel of Christ, which is given its penetration and power by the Spirit of God. Okay, I think he's talking about the proclamation of the word of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ, Peter O'Brien says, in their warfare with the powers of darkness, they're to take hold of the word of God, the gospel, and to proclaim it in the power of the Spirit. And Gordon Fee writes, he says, in urging them to take the sword of the Spirit and then identifying that sword with the word of God, Paul is not identifying the sword with a book, but with the proclamation of Christ, which in our case is indeed found in a book. Okay, so he's talking, I think, about proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, how does that act in this warfare? And I got a couple of thoughts on that. Sharing the gospel protects the Christian who's sharing it through strengthening his identification with that message. All right, speaking publicly about your convictions reinforces and strengthens those convictions. When you are out telling people about Jesus, that's why the Mormons take their kids and have them go off on mission work. Because they know that throwing them in a situation where you have to speak and defend what you believe ties you tighter to that. Okay, and I think we've lost sight of this. But that's one way in which I think it, it, it helps. But sharing the gospel also is an assault on the enemy's realm. It's the means by which men and women come to faith and thus are delivered from Satan's grasp. We're in there stabbing. You see, we're, we're assaulting his kingdom. By saying, I know you've captured these people, but we're coming in. And with the power of the Spirit, we're coming in and we're drawing them out. Drawing them out in the name of Jesus Christ. So as you see these things. So he talks about this, he's urging them there. He says, watch and pray. This spiritual combat, this standing firm in the face of demonic opposition, it includes dependence on God in prayer. Christians are to pray at all times and their prayers are to be in the Spirit Prayer is to be a frequent, regular part of our lives, a practice we never abandon or cease from engaging in because our struggle with the forces of evil will not end until the consummation. In this overlap of ages, we are going to be in this struggle until the Lord comes back. We will be in this battle so we are never to cease, never to give up, continue to pray. And we're to pray in the Spirit, meaning we're to pray in a way that's consistent what the Spirit would have us pray we're to pray with a proper attitude, proper motives, and in line with and deference to God's will. You know, oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? I don't think so. Now, if he's got a Mercedes Benz for you, that's okay. <laughs> you see? But uh, Janice was going off a little bit there. All right, so now we, of course, are to pray for our spiritual strengthening, but we also pray for all the saints. We need to do that. This is a type of prayer life that needs alertness, which keeps at bay spiritual sleep and complacency and the perseverance that overcomes fatigue and discouragement. You have to be at that. You have to be disciplined. It is easy to be lulled away from there, pulled away from this. Now, Paul asks that they pray for him, that he may boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which he's an ambassador in chains. And I think you can see the result of that in, in 2 Timothy 4. 16 and 17, but I'm not going to talk about that. I want to read the last section here, just so I made it through. All right. He says, now in order that you also may know the things concerning me, 
What I'm doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I've sent him to you for this very thing, so that you may know the things concerning us, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all of you who love the Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptibility. Paul says, listen, Tychicus is going to bring this letter. He can fill you in on my situation and encourage your hearts. He commends Tychicus to them as a beloved brother, faithful servant in the Lord. Isn't that what we want to be? Beloved brother, faithful servant in the Lord. You can't say anything better about somebody than you say he's a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here is Tychicus. Paul says a faithful servant. And he, he, he also delivers, Tychicus delivers the letter to the church in Colossae. You see in chapter 4, Colossians 4, 7 and 8. Acts 20, verse 4, identifies Tychicus as being from the province of Asia, someone who was with Paul in Greece and went with him to Troas at the end of his third missionary journey. And then Paul here in this last paragraph, ah, i got a minute, nah. In this last paragraph, he concludes by expressing his desire that God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ will supply his readers with a subjective experience of the peace that is already theirs in Christ. We have peace in Christ, but sometimes we don't grasp it. And he wants us to experience it. And he's prayed for that throughout, you know, this idea of may the Spirit give you this understanding. May he manifest himself in your life as a spirit of insight and wisdom. So that you may come to grasp and recognize the things that are yours. He wants them to have that subjective experience of peace. And also prays that that God will strengthen them in their love and faith. Okay, that's something to pray, okay? For all of us, and he wishes the blessing of God's grace and all who love the Lord Jesus with incorruptibility, or as the NIV says, with an undying love. Hope that was beneficial. Thanks.